For this video, I'm going to try something a little different. I um, created a problem set, sort of exploratory problem set for my students uh, that's on the left. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do work solutions for this. If you really want to learn this, um, then the right way to watch this video is to uh, look at the problems I'm doing and pause the video a lot and try to do them on your own as much as possible. And then just kind of follow along with the solutions and, and, and use them as hints. So. Um, the first problem is taking off right from the, the last video, uh, just kind of making sure we understand that the, the concepts there by doing it in another simple example. So we've got a, uh, a surface in R3 S, and it's parameterized. So here's the X, Y, Z land. Here's the UV space parameters. Here's D, and here's our parameterization map phi. Um, and then we've got a function. Um, well, we would well we've got a I'm sorry we've got a two form that we want to integrate on that. Okay, so and we'll, we'll eventually talk about how there's functions involved as well that we want to think about. Um, so let me just sketch the two form p dy wedge dz dy wedge dz are that's kind of tubes of flux that kind of go this way. And so we can think of it as a, fluing, a fluid flowing, and I just totally screwed that up. Messed up already. It's dy wedge dz. That would be dx wedge dz, sorry. dy wedge dz uh, has the, the, two, the flu fluid flowing basically in the x direction. Okay. Um, and so we want to just get the flux of that fluid through s, to an uh, in analogy with what we had before. And so we want to calculate the integral over s, let's do a simple example first before we work up to the whole thing, p dy wedge dc. So we're going to take this guy and we're going to scale it. So maybe it's got a certain density of tubes here, and then maybe the tubes gets denser and smaller, so you're fitting more flux into the same region um, as you go, and maybe that's going to give you a, a bigger integral over a surface that might be down here. Okay, So let's work that out. We're supposed to, the, the, uh, the idea here, and people were asking in class about this notation of the pullback. It's a very general idea that we've got a mapping, a transformation between two universes. And we've got a structure. This red tube structure is the differential form on this universe. And we want to say there's a corresponding structure over here. And that's what we saw in the video before. We want to say that somehow these tubes intersecting the surface when we pull that back, we get just nice some sort of grid. I, I keep drawing as a uniform grid, but it's not going to be uniform in general. It's going to have different spacing at different places. That's what makes it interesting. Okay, and that's what this notion uh, in, involves. That's what that upper star means. There's a very general yoga here, where if I've got a transformation, it happens to be called phi here. There's nothing special about the letter, um, and I've got some sort of structure. I take that, and the upper star means it's something that goes against the arrow. It takes the structure and it pulls it back. Okay, and we'll see another example of that in a, in a second. It's not one we. It's not one that's new, but I want to reiterate um, what's going on. So let's see. Uh, I can fit one more line in here. So that's going to be now. This is the the part where it's really great. Phi star. My assertion is that that. Um, goes inside the product, the phi star of a product, ordinary scalar product and wedge product is the product of the phi stars, and it goes inside the D, and so phi star P times D of phi star. That's a terrible phi. That's worse than my usual capital phi's. Phi star Y wedge D of phi star C. Okay, now here's something that came up. Um, phi star y looks maybe a little weird because y has two meanings. Um, y can be, we can think of as a coordinate, as just like a variable. But remember, it's also a function. f of x, y, z equals y. That's really the role we have for y right here. When we say dy, remember d is supposed to be something that applies to a function. d of y is the one form that that gives you basically the the um, the one form version of the gradient of y, and that's why it has these the its its sl its uh, level sets are just slices in the parallel in the y direction, okay, um, and so we're really thinking of of y as a function, 
not a variable. And that really is a sort of more sophisticated view of, of, of why. This is not something we've never seen before. It's just, it's a little bit of a perspective switch that, that seems to mess people up a little bit. Now, phi star of functions, that's another example of this idea of taking a structure, like here's the y function on um, xyz space, and pulling it back. So I have something that assigns to every point in xyz space a number, namely the y-coordinate. Okay, well, that's a structure on, X, on xyz space, on R3, something that assigns to every point in space a number. Well, can I, is there a corresponding thing that assigns to every point in this plane, or at least everything in D, a number? Yeah, it's called a function on D. And the way we get that is we just compose. And we just take y of phi of u and v. Well, that's, that's just basically y of u and v. OK, so now I have to let me keep my picture. Okay, and so that's going to be the integral over d. So I, all those pullbacks, it's just co function composition. So I, I get p of phi of u and v times d of y of u and v uh, wedge d of z of u and v. And I guess here I put the phi in. Let's just... I, 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 did, I suppress the phi here for, for clean, cleanliness of notation. Let's just do this. So when I say p of u and v, I really mean p of x of u and v, y of u and v, z of u and v. But I'm going to suppress that in the notation. Now, the d here, this is where derivatives come in. Somehow derivatives have to come in. The, what's happening here is the d no longer is just sitting uh, looking at an ordinary just um, coordinate variable where it's not very interesting and you get like the analog of the gradient like 0 comma 1 comma 0 for the gradient of y. It's now looking on something on R2. This is a function on R2, and it's probably a very interesting function on R2. And so we can actually do something with it. There's going to be interesting partial derivatives to take. And so we get p. I'm going to streamline the notation some more. And we get um, partial y partial u du plus partial y partial v dv wedge partial y partial uh, partial z sorry partial u du plus partial z partial v dv okay and now i can expand that out now there's something interesting to do okay so no, i didn't leave myself much room with this picture here i think i'm actually going to erase the picture you can always rewind back if you want to see the picture again okay and then we're almost done okay and that's the integral of p. Uh, and then we're going to get, very similar to in the other video, we're going to get dy du dz dv minus dy dv dz du du wedge dv. And the du wedge du and the dv wedge d, dv cancel out. Let me just think a second to make sure that's the right order. Yeah, OK. And this minus sign comes from a dv wedge du flipping to become a du wedge dv. Um, OK, so that's, that's it. That's what it corresponds to. And then if you had a, an explicit function p and the explicit x or y and z as functions of u and v, you could actually calculate that. OK, so then what's part b? Now we really do the, the real thing. p dy wedge dz plus q dz wedge dx plus r dx wedge dy. Notice the pattern here. Um, that's a z. This misses, is missing x, and so the p, which usually corresponds to x, it makes sense that it's actually corresponding to the one that's missing here. q usually, usually, usually corresponds to y. That's the one that's missing here, similarly for r and z, which is missing from here. And notice the order I'm writing things in. It's cyclic order, x, then y, then z, thought of in a circle. And the trick, this is you, you see this in cross products as well, that's when you get positive stuff if you go around this in a circle. So in particular, this guy is not dx wedge dz, which you might think would be a better way to write it in alphabetical order. This is in cyclic order. OK. So this whole thing, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. We just did this guy. Um, this one with an f was in the other video. And then this is very, very similar. And so you just get p times dy du dz dv minus dy dv d 
cz to u plus q <clears throat> times a very similar thing, the dz is going to turn into partial z partial u. The dx is going to turn into partial x partial v <clears throat> minus, uh, let me see, minus, and then it's going to be dz dv dx du plus r, and then this one is really straight from the other video, dx du dy dv minus dx dv dy du. And then that's all integrated du dv. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, this looks like a mess, but it's exactly a mess that we're, we're actually really familiar with because these guys are the components of um, the cross product of that comes into the usual way of describing a flux integral. That guy, I claim, is equal to the integral of d of p um, q, let's see, let's see what we want. Um, well, rem remember what we, what we would do if this were a flux integral, plus rk, dotted with ds, because how do you actually expand that out? You take um, pi plus qj plus rk, you dot it with ru cross rv, and then you do duv, dv. Okay, and um, this guy, when you expand it out, has exactly those partial derivatives that we saw in the earlier thing. Okay, so that's the end of problem one. Now, one thing that I noticed of not maybe not doing things in the right order, looking at this, is when we got down to just integral d of like some function du wedge dv. I think I am kind of doing this a little backwards. I wanted to stay in R3 as much as possible, but I forgot that when we do this, we're going to get an integral in a, over a region of R2. Okay, And in R2, if I have this kind of integral, it's extremely tempting to just forget that wedge product is there and then say, oh, wait a minute, that, do you mean just the ordinary integral, f du dv? And the great thing is that temptation should absolutely be yielded to. That is the definition. So an integral of a two-form in R2, or a region in R2, is just what it looks like without the little wedge symbol. Now, the wedge symbol still has a little bit of a meaning because, remember, it's anti-commutative. If I did dv wedge du in the opposite order, then that is actually taken to mean negative of what we got there because we really are supposed to treat this as an oriented. So what's going on is our usual notions of oriented, of, of integrals are unoriented. And this guy is really supposed to be oriented. And so we actually pay attention to the order here and not pay attention to the order here. So Fubini's theorem says we, we really can exchange this at will. You, you still, Fubini's still really crucial for doing these kinds of things um, and changing order of integration. But we actually, when we flip the order, we're supposed to put a sign in. So that's what that negative sign is. But basically, the idea is that if you're integrating a two form over R2, then it's just what, what it looks like. And that allows you to calculate stuff when you get down to the two dimensions and, and equate it with stuff like this that we were doing before. Okay. Um, good place to stop and do another video for the, uh, some of the other problems.